So just going into this book here, uh, History of Gangster Rap. Yes. Which I feel like it's one of the best books I've written. I mean, I've written, uh, listened, to, uh, read. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Especially in hip hop, for yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, have great images. It's well written, chronological order. Um, I feel like you did really did you really did your research on this one. And, thank you. Um, I guess I, I just I wish we had like more than an hour because I can feel like we can talk about this for hours, pretty much. Yeah. Um, but but why do you feel it's necessary to uh, to write a book about gangster rap? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, one is my favorite artist in rap history is Schooly D, and he created Gangsta Rap. And I think a lot of people overlook him and don't realize the effect that he had on not only Gangsta Rap, but rap in general, and then in music in general. So that was important to me, and I've gotten to know him and be friends with him over the years. And tied into that, was as rap evolved, I realized that in general, gangster rap, I thought was among the best, if not the best, at telling stories about what was going on in society and addressing a lot of societal ills that we have in America as far as the racial legacy that we have and the atrocious conditions that our society has created, especially against blacks in America. And I felt that Gangster rap in particular examined and went through that reality better than anything else that I was exposed to. Mm. Uh, obviously, books influenced a lot of the writer or artists um, from reading some of the books and similar books to what I had read growing up. But once the music came out, they were doing it in an artistic way that I didn't see that was being done in any other way. And then <clears throat> they addressed. Uh, economic disparities, police brutality, racial injustice, a lot of things that were going on and that I was seeing, you know, not on my necessarily my street where I grew up, but when I would go into Baltimore, when I would go into DC, which was often, I would see what these guys were rapping about was happening all the time. And I, thankfully, thanks to my parents, I read a lot. So I'd read the Washington Post, I'd read the Baltimore Sun, and the capital, which was for Annapolis, Maryland. And so I would read a lot of the stories and that was done by, you know, the reporters or when I would see the news, they kind of gave a different take on what was happening. Whereas the rappers were talking about either reporting on what was going on or talking about it from a first person of what they had to deal with growing up in an area where people were on crack, people were in gangs, people were getting shot, people were abusing drugs. And this was going on and was rampant in the, you know, starting when gangster rap started with Schooly D in the mid 80s and 1985 or so, all the way up till today. And so I wanted to really explain through the book, The History of Gangster Rap, that this is not mindless music. A lot of people I've noticed throughout the years in my interaction with other people, they really get caught up on the profanity or the N-word, or the violence, or the B-word, or the F-word, or whatever right. thing that they get caught up on, but they don't understand that just looking at an album, which I think is the best gangster rap album ever, Ice Cube's Death Certificate, if you look at that album, you have him talking about the, men, the healthcare disparity of Alive on Arrival. You have him talking about, you know, getting arrested uh, for false crimes. You have Black Korea, where he's talking about the animosity between the Koreans and the Blacks in Los Angeles and how a girl had gotten shot in the back, you know, for not even over an argument about a bottle of orange juice. So these are reflecting real life things. And then he has, at the end of the album, he has a song called Us, where he also is like, look, Black America, we're selling drugs to our own people. We're killing ourselves. We also, all these things are against us, but we also have to realize we're responsible also for what we can do to help ourselves and to make the situation better. So like that type of album, I think is phenomenal and is one of the best rap albums made period of all rap. But then it's in my opinion, the best gangster rap album for sure. And it sadly, everything I think ice cube rapped about that album came out in 1991. And I discuss it in detail in my book, the history of gangster rap, but 
most, if not all, of what Ice Cube rapped about in 1991 is still happening in 2019. So it's very unfortunate, but it also shows why gangster rap is so important and why it hasn't gone away. Because all the things, Schooly D, Ice T, Easy E, NWA, Ice Cube, and everyone else that makes gangster rap raps about, those societal conditions in America and throughout the world are still here and they still exist. And that's why the music to me was important to write about, but also important to show the breadth of it, the depth of it, and the fact that there are so many people that have done such an amazing artistic job with the genre over the years. And they're by and large, and the guys that I focus on it, especially are not glorifying this stuff. They're telling you the pitfalls of it. That's also something that I think is important. This is not mindless music. This is music made by predominantly men, but men that, you know, have, they're very intelligent, they're very opinionated, and they make very powerful work that really goes to illustrate why things are happening in society and how it affects people. You know, it's not, there's other types of rap that celebrate, you know, other things like doing drugs or, you know, having all kinds of relationships with women or A, B, or C. And that also is included in gangster rap. But I think what I covered in my book and why I think gangster rap is so important is because it gives voice to the voiceless in a way that other forms of music and even other forms of rap don't do in the same way. Right, right, right. So would you say, is it, uh, was it the media or the artist that created the term gangster rap? Well, in my book, The History of Gangster Rap, I actually talk about that. That was created by the media. It was actually one of my other mentors, Robert Hilburn, that from the Los Angeles Times that is credited with creating it. But I interviewed MC Ren from NWA. I interviewed DJ Quick. I interviewed CJ Mack. I interviewed Cormega. And I interviewed uh, Paris. All about the term gangster rap and what they thought about it and why... Um, you know, why it's stuck or what it means. But most of the artists don't like the term. So, you know, I do cover that in the book and it's very detailed and all those artists speak on it specifically. So hopefully people will read it and, and we'll I look, like look I forward to hearing what they have to say about it. Right, right, right. So um, when you say gangster rap, like I guess most people, when they hear that term, they, they automatically think about the West Coast. But you actually... Right. Say it's uh, Schooly D who created Gangster Rap. Yeah, Schooly D created it, and he's from Philadelphia, which is the east coast of the United States. Right, right, right. And it was more like an entrepreneur. Like he did, uh, he did his artwork himself, and he started, he started like what was it, PSK, right? The song PSK. Well, yeah, the, P the song PSK. So yes, yeah, Schooly D was very entrepreneurial. He was the first rapper to have his own record label. He drew his own album covers and his single covers. He did all of his own production. He wrote all his raps or wrote his raps. And then he also did the drum programming. So he did basically everything literally for himself except scratching. And once uh, 85 came around, Code Money was his DJ. He had another DJ earlier on, but Code Money was his DJ. Um, throughout his career and basically Schooly did everything else. Like he had his own record company, Schooly D Records. And then he was a one man shop. Like I talk about in my book, The History of Gangster Rap. And the thing that was great about it is because I'm friends with Schooly, when I interviewed him for the book, I just asked him, I was like, hey man, do you have any art that you've never published? And uh, he gave me an exclusive piece of art that had never been published before that's in my book. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, pretty amazing as someone that looked at his artwork as a little kid to now write a book that features him prominently and then for him to give me uh, some exclusive art that he used and had never put out was like mind blowing. It was amazing. That was an amazing so, feeling. So this song actually got, Ice-T got influenced by this song and that's why he made uh, Six and Six. One. Yep. And it has so pretty much the same cadence. You can hear. And so if you look at it too, Boys in the Hood by Easy E has a similar cadence too. So all this goes back to Schooly D. Right, right, right. And then we got the uh, yeah, NWA and uh, yeah, the pro progress of that. Yeah. So when was the first time they actually um, uh, they were claiming sets and songs like gang? 
Uh, that, you know, it's a little bit different to actual sets because sometimes you'll say a street which is affiliated with the set, but it's not the actual set. So that's a little strange, but it didn't happen immediately, um, which is another thing I talk about a lot in the book. So DJ Quick was one of the first people. I, uh, King T actually had said stuff about having a blue rag, but that just meant he was a crip and that, you know, there's dozens of crip sets. So that wasn't a specific one. But, you know, I guess on the crip side, it was probably King T. And on the blood side, I would say it was DJ Quick. Okay, okay. Because so as I talk about in my book extensively, initially the artists made a big point to not promote their gang because they didn't want to cut off that portion of the audience from themselves. And they also, you know, the gang life, I know people popularize it and make it out like it's just entertainment, but it's not. You know, people die on a regular basis right. off of gang banging. And if you look back, especially the early guys, Ice T, Easy E, NWA, if you look back, they typically wore black or white. They didn't wear blue or red, even though most or all those guys were either in a gang or grew up in a neighborhood that was a specific gang. They didn't promote what gang they were in. That came a few years later. Or several years later, actually. Okay. Cool, cool. So I read in your book as well, like, um, when Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg uh, started doing their music, like, uh, they slowed down music a little bit. And uh, it made it more, like, seemed like they'd be more, like, they were more laid back and people could really relate to them more, I guess, than yes. prior to, like, the NWA and stuff. Yeah. So. Um, really, uh, <clears throat> As I talk a lot about in the book, Above the Law really made that the foundation of their music. Mm. And then, uh, you know, Dre kind of, we saw a little bit of this um, Always Into Something from NWA's second album. But Above the Law really slowed it down because they were using the funk samples similar to what Dre had used with NWA, but they used them in a different way. They used it with uh, the Vocally Pimpin' EP and then Black Mafia Life album. They used the samples in a very similar way to the singles were used on the chronic. But, you know, Above the Law really created that. Then Dr. Dre perfected it. Snoop on Doggy Style had the G-Funk intro. So Snoop kind of branded it, really. And then Warren G made it, you know, what he built his career off of. You know, um, Tupac had said on the Call It What You Want song by Above the Above the law, you know, this is G-Funk and stuff like that. But really it wasn't until, and that was all internal stuff that people like the Tupacs and Above the Laws and Snoop and Dre and all those guys would know it. But I'm talking about like the public. It wasn't really until Snoop called it the G-Funk intro. And then Warren G was like, this is G-Funk, you know, and made that regulate the G-Funk era. That really changed it. But the Sonics, I have a great quote from Yuckmouth from the Loonies <clears throat> in the book about how Above the Law slowed the music down because N.W.A. and their sound was much more like the Bomb Squad, Public Enemy, very fast, very aggressive, whereas Above the Law slowed it down, and then Dre slowed it down, and then Snoop was slow, and then Warren G was slow, as opposed to the super fast music that you know, NWA was most famous for. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, um, when did, uh, No Limit come into this, like, with Master P? No Limit came in the mid nineties. To me, they really blew up on a national, cause Master P had been doing it for several years, but then really in 96, 97 is when he exploded because of, and I talk about it in my book, but he, when he signed with Priority Records, he got national distribution and all the momentum he had built because he was based in Northern California in Richmond, but then was from New Orleans. So he had a weird two region appeal that a lot of people didn't have. Mm. And he had a, he had a crew, the no limit soldiers that he had in the mid nineties. But, you know, he really was the I'm about it song. Then I'm about it movie. And then he really exploded in 97 with the ghetto D album that had to make him say, uh, I miss my homies. But that really just 
made him explode. And then we saw the Master P Empire really take off, I'd say, in 97. It was really when it kicked in big time. He had the Ice Cream Man album had been super successful, but that was, we're talking gold compared to like double platinum. It's like a huge Mm -hmm. difference, but he had, you know, he had been making moves and I'm about it with the TRU album, the Real Untouchables, you know, that stuff was doing well and and making moves, but it was nothing like we saw what happened in 97. Okay. Did Cash Money have pretty much the same effect as well or? Well, Cash Money, they, um, not only were they after No Limit as far as huge success, uh, Cash Money, so Master P's big breakthrough was probably like in 97. Cash Money's big breakthrough was more like in 99 where we had Juvenile really blow up with the Back That Ass Up and then Bling Bling and all those records. Those came three, two to three years after Master P. Okay. Okay. Or after 97, I should say. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So uh, I guess we have like, uh, there's a big news about Nipsey Hustle today. Um, so what's your take on this, this situation? Like, I mean, it's very unfortunate. You know, he obviously was hugely popular and influential and was a big gangster rapper and rapped about a lot of the street reality. Mm. And, and, you know, from I've talked to him a few times over the years, but he was, from all accounts, like, very business savvy, a very good father, from what I could tell, and active help in the community. But, you know, it's just very unfortunate because, you know, like I mentioned earlier in this discussion, like the gang stuff is real, man. Like Mm. it's not something that it's not a light switch. You just turn it off and on. Like that's what he came from. And it's very unfortunate that that street stuff, you know, followed him because because of all the good that he was doing. Like he was still, from everything I know and from uh, knowing people that work with him directly and all this other stuff, I mean, he was doing a lot of very positive things. So it's just another unfortunate example of, you know, uh, a man getting killed uh, from just from violence. Right, right. Is it fair to say that he was like the Tupac of this generation or? I wouldn't make that comparison, in my opinion, because I think Tupac, you know, Tupac was a movie superstar. Tupac had sold millions and millions and millions of records. We're in a different era now. So it's hard. You know, I think Tupac is the second biggest selling rapper of all time. Hmm. How much did he sell, like, all eyes on me, like 10 million or? Well, you have to remember, double albums count twice. So it's mm-hmm. really probably sold more five or six million. Because oh, it's okay. two CDs, it counts twice. Okay, okay. So it's a little tricky. People say it sold 10 million, and I guess five million were sold. But since there's two of them, they count it as 10 million. But it's really five million copies of the album were sold. Mm-hmm. It's, it, so it didn't sell 10 million actual copies. That's not accurate. And they use like sound scan, right? For determining yes. the album. But scan. it's that's what I'm saying with comparing Nipsey and Tupac's a little tricky because now it's streams. So it's not people actually buying the music, it's people listening to it online. Mm. And that is just not a similar comparison because you're one is spending money, one is not spending money. One is uh actually investing to at the time to go to the record store to put in all that effort to actually buy something versus you on your phone your laptop or your desktop just pushing a button anywhere you are in the world and listening to something that you didn't pay for it's not the same thing 